Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's time for me to tell you my story about what really happened. So, I'm just glad everybody's here. <laughs> and it's amazing how many people come and just see Butch Cassidy's from the state of Utah. They did a survey before they um, before they renovated it for 400,000, and there were 70 to 90 people in the summertime that would just drop out. They counted. I started out earlier here, we are telling stories. Not just me, not just Marilyn, but our entertainment will be telling you some wonderful stories as well. I got a chance to listen to them while I rehearsed it. You're going to have a wonderful night. But you need to sit back, relax, get comfortable. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's time for me to tell my story about what really happened. There have been endless lies about my life as an outlaw, and it is time to set the record straight. Well, first of all, let's go to the movie. Who doesn't love the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with Robert Redford and Paul Newman? It's a classic. It's made like, it's made like $2 billion over the last 50 years. This is the true story of Butch Cassidy. Do you see that they didn't die in Bolivia and they went to Paris, France and have a facelift? And it's the first time you've ever heard of, right? So the very first bit of evidence we got that William Thaddeus Phillips was Butch Cassidy was with Dr. John McCulloch. And you'll see all the pictures in our book. So we have Finding Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Butch Cassidy and Morning Boy Dies in Utah, and the secret life of Butch Cassidy after Bolivia. But to make a long story short, we, we kind of didn't let Butch rest in peace. <laughs> we went up there and started digging. I wish the Burr Handyman could be there. They're coming with us tomorrow. We're going with the group. We're going to film it. We're putting all the rocks back. We actually found two bones. Okay, so we're at Little Dog Valley on the Parker Ranch. Afton Morgan purchased the 667-acre ranch from um, Mark Bentonson, Lula Parker Bentonson's son. And he gave us permission to come up here and to um, dig for possibly Butch Cassidy's body. He really, truly was buried here secretly. And we found a human bone that's matching the Parkers. And now we're back here to put the rocks back in. And we're finishing up this three-year project of looking for Butch Cassidy's body. He was moved from this cabin 
and they got an exclamation order when the Parkers owned it and got a backhoe up here the side of the cabin where they're filling in the rocks now we went down and they, we sifted all the way down we found shell casings a rabbit and some chips from the sagebrush so we know he went seven feet down and then the story is that you know, the sifter was in uh, like an archaeological dig and she said we got news in 1979 that they moved butch to lula's backyard and then I went to a convenience store because I was delivering books and if I was talking to the cashier and he goes, and I know the final story. He said, when Lula passed away in 1980 and they were widening the road behind her house, they moved Butch Cassidy next to his mother in the Circle Grove Cemetery. You're the first folks ever, besides reading our books, to even hear that. We know the final resting place of which Cassidy. How cool is that? The Pinkerton Detective Agency made my life a living hell. I tried to go straight many times, but being hunted made for desperate times. Just when I thought we were safe, the Pinkertons found out about our escape to Bolivia. I always felt like they came after me when I was down. Their aim was to try and keep me down. We had to liquidate everything we owned on our ranch in 1906 in Bolivia because they knew where we were and we needed to sell off everything so we could escape. We went on the run again. Etta had had enough of being hunted, so she went home, and I did not blame her. Me and Sundance had to move fast, or, or we were going to be dead men. We waited two weeks for a boat to take us down the coast of Pernambuco. From Pernambuco, we had to wait a month for a boat to Europe. We left our ranch in 1906 and arrived in Paris, France, and stayed until 1907. We were safe at last. We toured Europe before we returned to the United States. Thanks to our friend Percy Siebert, the, the head of the Concordia Tin Mines in Bolivia, everyone thought we were dead. I had saved Percy's life on many occasions, and he was repaying the favor. He also knew how sick of the outlaw life we were. Later we heard that Percy told the authorities that two bandits had been killed and that Percy had said the two American bandits were me and, and Sundance. From November of 1908, the World and the Pinkerton Detective Agency thought we were dead, and we let it be that way. Being in Paris seemed like a dream. We could finally live life without fear. From 1906 to 1907, we lived the life of European gentlemen. We bought the finest clothes and dined in the best restaurants in Paris. Our money went fast with all the temptations in a foreign country. Sundance wanted to return home. He had a wife and children in Utah that he had been sending money to. With Etta now gone and the romance over, we made a plan to go home. In Paris, I learned about a plastic surgeon named Dr. Louis Ombredane. He taught plastic surgery at the hospital there and would do surgery on anyone for a price. In 1902, he became the head surgeon of the Parisian Hospital in Paris. He taught surgery around the world, and his skills were world-famous. I contacted Dr. Oberdani and talked to him about changing my appearance. Sundance could go home to his wife, six stepchildren, and two daughters without any fuss. He had folks that would help hide him out, and who would suspect that he was the Sundance kid with a wife and all those kids. He had not seen his family in ten years, and he wanted to go back to his life in Loa, Utah. I decided to undergo plastic surgery so no one would recognize me when I returned. If I did not have surgery, I would instantly be recognized, and I was willing to do anything to keep my freedom. I entered the hospital and submitted to surgery to reduce my jawline and had my nose and ears altered. After three weeks of recovery, I looked in the mirror and I could see very little of my old self. So clever had the transformation been. Sundance did indeed go back to Utah and his family. He missed his children, especially his two girls. He changed his name to William Henry Long. He couldn't wait to return home. He had a second chance at life. We had one last photo taken together and vowed never to contact each other in fear of being discovered. We kept that promise. After leaving Paris, I would have to start a new life. 
I decided to go to Spokane, Washington. I always enjoyed the ocean and the Northwest. Upon my arrival, I needed a name that would give me a fresh start. So I went to the public library and found a young boy's name, William Thaddeus Phillips, who had died as a child. I took the identity of William Thaddeus Phillips. Now I had parents and a history in case anyone asked. I bought a home and found work. It was lonely but wonderful to be in a totally different environment. It is 1907 and the world is changing and I had to move with the changing times. I decided I needed to go to church. I dared not return to my Mormon roots because someone might recognize me. I couldn't take the chance. Besides, I, I like my coffee, an occasional drink, and I picked up the habit of smoking. I hoped to find a place where I could start over and change my ways. I believed in God and Jesus, and it was my sincere desire to start over and be on the straight and narrow. I felt I needed to start by being with good people. I started attending a local church and made some friends. I met a lady named Gertrude Livesey we started dating. I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. It was nice to have a good Christian woman by my side. Now, I have always been clever with my hands, and I started the Phillips Manufacturing Company. I built up my business of manufacturing parts for the adding and listing machine. My enterprise was a success, and Gertrude and I moved to a lovely new home, and we had friends and business relationships in our wonderful town of Spokane. We both wanted a family, but after many years of trying, we, we finally agreed to adopt. How blessed it was to adopt a baby boy. We truly had everything we could ever ask for. Then in 1929, the Great Depression hit and we lost everything. Everything we had worked for. My business failed, but I, I managed to save our home. My wife Gertrude took a job at the library to feed our family. I, I felt humiliated as a provider to be living off my wife. I borrowed a friend's Oldsmobile sedan and drove to Circleville. I went straight to the old homestead. The cabin had been abandoned, but I saw my brother Mark out in the fields. <laughs> we had a happy reunion. He told me the sad news about Mother's passing in 1905. He told me how she died of a broken heart because of my outlaw ways. I did not want to hear that I caused my mother's early death. Feeling regret, I did my best to carry on. At least I was home. Mark took me into town, and we went to my father Maximilian's home. We walked up to the house, and Dad came out. At first, he didn't recognize me, but as soon as I smiled, Dad knew instantly that I was his boy. We hugged and cried in each other's arms for a long time, then went inside to visit. Dad called Lula, my sister, and told her to come over and bring food for all of us. Lula made plenty of food and put her children to bed and came over to Dad's house. It was a shock for Lula to see me alive. She had heard so much about me over the years, but we had never known each other at all. We stayed up all night visiting. I not only had my family back, but I got to know my sister Lula. I told them that I had a wife and a son, and, I, and that I lived a good life. They asked me how I escaped and about my facelift in Paris, France. They could see that my nose, ears, and jawline had been altered. But Dad said, you cannot take away that smile or the voice. Dad said, with or without surgery, he would have recognized me. I explained to Dad that this is why I settled in Spokane, Washington. I, I did not want to come back to Utah. The risk was too great that someone would recognize me. I stayed for two weeks and went camping at my favorite place on the ranch, Tom's Cabin in Little Dog Valley. My brothers came with me and we saddled horses and, and went camping. That was the safest thing we could do not to be seen around town. We went into the mountains and camped and hunted and made up for lost time. Those two weeks were the happiest times of my life. It was good to be home. My father Maxie and my sister Lula now knew of my wish to bury me at Tom's cabin in Little Dog Valley. That place is my favorite and I have so many wonderful memories of camping there with my brothers. I wanted to be buried where I had the best time of my life and I felt safe at last. I asked Lula and Dad to please bury me with my head to the south and my feet to the north, so when I awoke from my sleep, I could see the North Star. I explained that the North Star had always been my guide when I was a cowboy, and I knew it would always be my guide home. They promised they would grant my dying wish. A few days later, I passed from this life on Lula's back porch of a heart attack. It was the end of the road for this old fellow. 
My family honored my wishes and buried me at Tom's cabin in Little Dog Valley on our family ranch. I looked forward to seeing my angel mother again, and I could finally say I was sorry. I woke up and I saw the North Star, and I was home. Home with my maker and ready to be before my God and beg for his forgiveness. I am home.